So as uh, things happened, we didn't have time to do a practice session or discuss about questions. So we are now doing this completely. Um, we have our Lennosta on the fly. Yes, uh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no. <laughs> Maybe you should talk a little closer. Mike, a little closer. Sorry? Mike, a little closer. Oh, a little, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fine. No, I got you. I got you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so where do we start? We start from. Let's start from your beginning. How did you. Uh, on one thing, for the audience, you are free to ask questions at any time. Our mic boy there will take microphone to you. So please uh, raise your hand and then speak to the microphone so we will catch it on the tape, on the recording. Well, and Jeff, where would you like to start your talk? Where, where did it all begin? Um, basically, it all started by me walking into the wrong room when I was in, in school. Um, I had no interest in computers whatsoever. I, I did, however, have an interest in Space Invaders. And um, happened to walk into this room one day where there was a guy sat in front of what looked like a, a, a TV set on top of a weird-looking typewriter and he was playing some kind of game on there. And I asked him, uh, you know, how do, how do you do that? How come you can play a game on this weird thing that I still didn't know the name of? And he said, oh, I typed it in. And that immediately piqued my interest. The idea of being able to type in something to this weird machine and make games was something that appealed to me immediately. So uh, I asked him more about it. He told me it was done in a language called BASIC. And I went to the school library and nicked a book on BASIC. And went, and went home that night. I tried to teach myself a little bit of BASIC by taking apart some TI-59 calculator programs that my brother had and redoing them in BASIC. I went in the next day, typed them into this Commodore PET, as it was called, uh, ran them. Of course, they didn't work. Um, but then there was a guy there who was a much more experienced programmer who started to teach me what to do. And after a few weeks, we were making BASIC games for one another. Uh, and then it went on from there. We discovered BASIC was too slow, so we got into uh, a machine code. Well, there was no assembler back then. You had to hand assemble everything. Um, it kind of went from there, really. I, I, I made my first fully machine code game when I was still at school. Um, at that point, there was no game market at all. There was no real home computer market. The only people who had these machines were, were, were rare nerds. Um, it was, wasn't until Clive Sinclair came along that the, the whole thing became popular enough to sustain a market in the UK. And uh, once that happened, then I, mean, I was extremely happy. The fact that I could sit and do this thing, which I enjoyed doing so much, and actually make a living at it and not have to get a proper job, was, uh, was excellent. <laughs> okay, let's... Uh, Giles, how did you end up with uh, at Lamasoft? I thought that's what it was, uh, a bit of a silly story, I mean, um, but the way it was, before the Amazon, I was working with a company who was specialising in security systems, video survey and stuff like that, but in reality that came out again as a, there's a very Western story also how it came out, but let's say we were doing a little bit of everything involving hardware and software, but thing happens, it was um, about six, seven years I was working for this company, things started to go a little bit south and in essence I, I was looking for another job, uh, at the time I really didn't know anything about him, I mean I never heard about him before and, and uh, I remember there was one evening I was at home, I was pretty, quite a bit depressed, quite bored and, and I can't remember exactly, I think I, actually I, I had to be something to do because I think I actually was so bored that I say, okay, I go to a cinema to watch something to distract myself. And it comes that was this, uh, just came out at the time um, in Italy that uh, Disney movie, The Emperor New Groove about Lama. So I was at home, I was Googling stuff about Lama. I don't know how I found his website. And checking his website, there was, there was some stuff about Lama. I, those things, but I don't even know why. I mean, it's just like I say, I decided to send him an email. I sent him an email. It was either like a few lines saying, "Oh, I see you like llamas and stuff. Maybe you might like my website. This is uh, the link if you want to have a look." 
that I had a little website about myself with some of the stuff I was doing and stuff like that. But I had no idea why I done it. It was just one of those things, you just done it. And then a couple of weeks passed by, didn't get any reply, completely forgot about it. I mean, okay, never mind. And then he comes out with a reply saying that he was on holiday and he couldn't see email until he came back. And then he saw my email and saw my website. And so we started talking about things and then things picked up from there. But uh, also I think there was a time that the story came with the opportunity to work with um, Microsoft. And you say you would be happy to have someone to help you about, with the thing. Okay. Uh, that, just a reminder for the audience, feel free at any time to ask questions or throw in comments. This is, uh, we can do this really, really freely. And uh, when you was uh, learning about coding, the basic coding, assembler coding, how did that happen actually? Because it was such early times and even in, fi in Finland in uh, 83, 85, it was extremely hard. Uh, hard to find the examples, find codes to write. How did you do it? Uh, well, I mean, this was 1979 and uh, we had this Commodore PET, but there wasn't any documentation with it. And uh, I remember actually working out, I, mean, I, I learned basic, just generic basic, not very machine specific from a book. And I was trying to do games and I, I kind of inferred that somewhere there must be a thing called screen memory and actually like, actually sort of poked around the system until I found where the screen memory was. And basically there were about four of us and we all helped each other out. Every time we learned something new about the machine, we'd inform all the rest. And so we kind of built up our knowledge. You know, we, we didn't have the internet to go online and find out w what other people were doing. We just sort of taught ourselves. And it was, it was a nice way to learn actually, because you really, really got to learn that machine inside out. And then later on, with, uh, some computer magazines would come out and you'd find the odd article by people like Jim Butterfield and stuff like that. It was a big Commodore uh, pet, or Commodore in general, uh, guru. So whenever you found something like that, it was like gold dust. But uh, and, uh, as for Assembler, um, I was told about the, the existence of machine language by one of the other lads who'd had a bit of experience with it in his, in his other school. Um, I got a book on, not 6502, because it didn't have a 6502 book, there was a book of 6800 um, uh, machine language in, uh, you know, manual, and I kind of worked out on paper some worked examples myself without actually really being able to run them on a machine. And then one of the teachers actually had a 6502 uh, uh, by, uh, manual by Rodney Cybex, and he lent it to me for one weekend, I was only allowed to keep it for one weekend, and so I copied down all the opcodes in the back and that, that, became, that little bit of piece of paper became my bible for like the, nec the, the next few months. So yeah, you, you basically you scrabbled at knowledge here and there, but uh, you gradually built up a good bo body of knowledge and shared it with your fellow enthusiasts. And there were only about five of us in the whole school who were interested in this stuff. Nobody else cared about it. I mean, they were all off, you know, going out with girls and doing normal things. <laughs> we, we were sat in the computer room praying to the alien, as we called it. Um, so yeah, the, the information was sparse, but when you, yeah, w it was kind of hard one, and it was a, it, it was very rewarding that we all raised each other up, and I think that's something which you see in the scene to, you know, even to this day. People will raise each other up and share knowledge, and I think that's a very positive aspect of it. And from that, you slowly get into into the games industry. Games, okay, there was no games industry in UK really at the time but how did it build up how did you get to publishing games and really getting them out to people um, well it's kind of in stages really I think when we first started doing this in 1979 it was just us making games between ourselves for this audience of like five and I never at that point thought it would be a career at all I, I went to university trying to get a, a, a computing qualification because I had, I had no A-level I had no formal education in this so I couldn't actually get onto the degree course I wanted to get onto so I ended up being on a maths and physics course that I really disliked and ended up flunking out of that um, and it wasn't until the ZX80 came out and that made it because uh, the Commodore PET uh, I learned on at school the, uh, the school only had one PET between all of us and you had to like book a half hour slot a day so you didn't have a, you know, given that it was a cassette based machine as well, you didn't have a lot of time to actually do any real coding. You had your loading, you had your saving, you had like 10 minutes in the middle to do some coding. 
So the idea of uh, uh, being able to own your own machine, even one as primitive as a ZX80, was a, an amazing thing. And it, the ZX80 only cost 100 quid. And so I was able to get a, a, a part-time job after school where I went cleaning toilets and offices in order to, to, to earn the money to buy my first 1K ZX80 and then gradually expand it, one, two, double, one, four at a time, a half a K of memory at a time, I built it up to 4K. Um, and then they started having these, uh, what they called ZX microfairs, where other enthusiasts with ZX80s and later ZX81s would go. And it was going to, to these things, I started seeing people selling games at these things. And this was quite interesting, I'd never seen that before. And one time I went along to one of these things, I, I took along just a cassette of a few 1K ZX80, ZX81 games I'd made, and I got chatting to a guy who was uh, worked for a company that made RAM packs. And he said, oh, yeah, I told him I had some games. He said, let me have a look at these games. I loaded them up and showed him. And he said, oh, yeah, would you do some stuff for us? And I said, yeah, I'd like to, but I've only got 4K of memory. He said, oh, OK, here you go. Have a 16K RAM pack. And, uh, you know, I was like, whoa, this guy's giving me hardware and telling me that I can, uh, I can make some games. And so for a while, I did games through him. It was an outfit called DK Tronics. And unfortunately, it didn't work out that well with him because it turned out he had a bit of a dodgy cousin and there was a lot of cross piracy of my games going on between the two of them. And, uh, and then the, the VIC-20 came out and I got the VIC-20 and I'm afraid I kind of abandoned Sinclair at that point because I've, I've, I'd learnt on Commodore kit, I'd learnt on the Commodore uh, Pet at school. And the lure of the VIC-20 with its really noisy sound chip and proper keyboard was too much after having been on the ZX80 and ZX81. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love my Uncle Clive. He did a, a hell of a lot for the, uh, the UK software industry, but I was a Commodore guy at, at heart. He's the specky boy. Uh, <laughs> there are specific reasons for that, so maybe I will explain why. But anyway, so I've, I've got the Commodore Pet, and at that stage I started working with another guy who was based in the same town where I lived, a guy called Richard Jones. And he, him and his dad were trying to say to me, oh, we'll take care of all the business stuff, you just write the software. And they would take 70% and I would get 30%. And at that point, my mum kind of bridled and said, look, we're not having that. She said either you know, she would come in with me and us two would, would form a partnership with those two and it'd be 50-50 or not at all. And so they said no, so we said not at all. So they went off and did Interceptor Micros and we stayed and started Llamasoft. And it kind of went from there really. Uh, we were fortunate enough, the first computer show we went to, um, I'd, I'd done, I'd done a, a really spectacularly bad version of Defender. But I mean, this was back in the days where people were selling all manner of crap on the VIC-20 because you could just sell anything back then. So even my bad version of Defender wasn't the worst thing in the room. And um, some American guy came up and said, would I, could I put that on cartridge for him for sale in the US? And I said, yes, even though I didn't know how to do that. I didn't have the first idea how to do that. But I thought, oh, he's going to sell some games in the US. I'll do that. So I did that. And it was OK. You know, it sold OK in the US. But then I did Grid Runner for him. And Grid Runner just really took off in the US. Grid Runner actually was like number one, number two on the charts at one point in the US and did really well for us. And that really set Llamasoft up for the rest of its 8-bit career. Uh, did you did you sell direct also mail order or through publishers? Uh, we, st we, we we did most of our stuff. Um, in early days, we did uh, a lot of mail order stuff. Um, later on, we did get distributed by sort of the major chains. You know, Boots and uh, W H Smiths and places like that in the UK were fairly major retailers at that point. Um, a couple of times. Other firms came in and said, Jeff, you know, let us publish your games because working through a proper publisher instead of your mum is going to be much more efficient. But it really wasn't. One time we did it with, uh, with Ariola Soft. I remember the, the boss of Ariola Soft coming over to me and saying, Jeff, Jeff, how rich do you want to be? You know, come with us. And we went with him and the game didn't really do that much better than it would have done as a Llama Soft release. And the same thing with Houston, who released uh, Iridis Alpha. Uh, and also, they, they, they managed to uh, uh, botch up the tape duplication and release it with a bug in so that when you got to the bonus round, it crashed, which didn't impress me about their production qualities. But in neither of those cases did it seem to do any better than, than we would do on our own. So we kept doing our own distribution for most of the time. Gradually, that started to roll off as the industry got a bit more commercial. 
uh, the, the major distributors didn't want to buy from small people like us who weren't placing huge amounts of advertising and gradually it became a lot more difficult for us to get distributed and that was when we took a step in the direction of shareware when we did Llamatron and since then most of the money that I've made has been from doing stuff for other people like um, I mean uh, doing Tempest for Atari and things like that I haven't, we haven't really made that much money doing stuff on our own we've made a bit here and there oh, Polyb to be fair Polybius has done fairly well but uh, yeah these days we're making most of our money from picking up work elsewhere rather than doing the stuff that we release on our own and uh, what about uh, games press? You had uh, sometimes wild, uh, wild relations to, to the games media, or how, how did you work with uh, UK magazines, or did you have any contact with uh, non-UK magazines? Um, I mostly, I, I, I used to do occasional columns for magazines. I, I, I think a Commodore user did one. I did one for Zap, which famously blew up when I, I, <laughs> I didn't like Ruhi. They did one of my games. Um, that was possibly me being a bit of an oversensitive asshole at that point, but there we are. Um, so yeah, I did, used to do, I, I did the development diary as well for, I think it was Iridis Alpha. Um, so yeah, I used to do a little column here and there. I used to do a, 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 a newsletter as well, which I'd send out to, uh, to fans who wanted to. I, it wasn't monthly, it was just whenever I felt like it, Lee, really, but uh, that was always fun to do. Um, but generally, my, my relationship with the press was, was, was pretty good. It's only in that one famous case where I fell out with Zap that, uh, unfortunately, that's the one that most people tend to remember. But uh, anyway, that's all, all, all water under the bridge now. <laughs> A long time ago. I don't think uh, most people know, remember, okay. okay. How many people know about the case with, with Zap? None. No, nobody <laughs> knows Zap 64, no, no. <laughs> Well, I guess it is kind of well before everybody's time now. I'm, if I come to these things, I, I'm, 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 I feel completely ancient these days, it must be said. Okay, about the style of you, you, you guys, llamas of the games, there's always been, you have always been doing very unique games with your own very personal style, often with llamas and so on, and of course, llamas of the world, where this style comes from? Um, partially, well, I mean, in the early days, I just liked beasties. I mean, um, you have to blame the origin of that uh, of the animal style. I think on um, on a magazine called Computer and Video Games, uh, they did um, a review of the Parker Brothers uh, VCS game called Empire Strikes Back that was based on the Star Wars film, and had the like, very crude graphics of the you know, the big walkers from the uh, the, the, the Hoth planet battle. And uh, they described these things as looking like giant mechanical camels. And I read this review and I thought, why don't I actually do that with camels, <laughs> with giant camels? And so I did. And um, it kind of worked in our advantage, really, because people liked that. It was very distinctive. People remembered, oh, that camel game. And I started putting more beasties in the games. And I, we kind of became known for doing these games that always had sheep and camels and weird things in them. Um, in the later days, the style that we developed is a very kind of trippy, abstract, psychedelic style, and I think part of that is at least in due, at least due to the fact that I'm rubbish at art, and so we do, and also we don't, we can't really afford to employ an artist, so we tend to do a lot of stuff that's uh, very abstract and procedural, simply because you can make stuff that looks cool without, without necessarily being able to draw. So I think a lot of the latter style that we do now is based on, on, on that limitation. I think it's quite, e quite interesting sometimes to work with a limitation rather than just like hire somebody else to overcome it. And uh, about uh, the animals in the games, there were also... Well, a lot of your games have different animals and uh, I remember Hover Bover, it had a dog. And I think uh, it had uh, some kind of interesting uh, development story. Oh, Hover Bover is uh, absolutely one of one of, one of my favourite um, favourite games that I made on the, on the Commodore 64 because it was made it was designed between me and my father. We were actually at a computer show in Birmingham and we were staying in in a rather nice bed and breakfast in this posh. A uh, uh, farmhouse is too small of a word for it. It's kind of a little a mansion really with some quite expansive grounds, lovely grounds. And uh, we were sat there one morning having breakfast, looking out the window, and there was a guy outside. 
mowing the lawn. We were watching him going back and forth, and uh, I, I started saying to me, "Dad, oh, you know, I'm sure he could make a game out of that." And he said, "Yeah, you could have, you could, have, you, know, you could have borrowed your, your neighbour's mower, and perhaps he's trying to get it back." And I'm like, "Yeah, and you could have a daft dog that you could set on the, <laughs> set on the neighbour." And then, and then he said, "Yeah, and perhaps the dog could get annoyed after a while and it starts attacking you." But within the space of five minutes, we had the design of this roughed out between us. Um, we didn't really know what we were going to call it. And then on the car on the it, it, on the way into the, the the show, it suddenly occurred to me there was a an advert on TV at the time by Flymo, who uh, make hover mowers, and it had the tagline, "It's a lot less bother with a hover." And so I thought, hover bother, there we go, make the mower fly mow and then, then make the game hover bother. And uh, I, I really like that game because it's one of the most different games we've done. It's not a shoot 'em up, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like a dy dynamic puzzle game, really. It's a painting puzzle game, and I haven't really done anything like it since. And I'm particularly fond of it because, as I say, it was exactly a collaborative effort between me and my dad as opposed to being just something I did. So I'll always be fond of that one, I think. And it's really that kind of you should you should people you people should check it out because it's also one of my quite old game memories playing with friends with some girls in a dark room play, playing different games and then I can remember playing hover bover probably as a pirate copy yeah. sorry very much but <laughs> I do remember that uh, when we demonstrated it at computer shows it, when you, uh, the computer shows back then used to be really long they'd last like four or five days some of the shows in London and when you're there behind your stand demonstrating the, the latest game all day and it's got that tune going on all the time do, 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 and it just loops and loops and loops and after five days of that you're going out of your head <laughs> I would suggest you ask him before at some point uh, because it's a really, really nice story how when uh, the design of Polybius how it came out when we first demonstrated to it to Sony uh, what was the reaction because that time we really tried sounds that we never tried before and it was like we had no idea if it could have been like to say die or uh, make or bust because it, it was being interesting how we were now uh, well um, Polybius is a game which, which which took rather too long to make really and part of that was I, d I wasn't quite sure what direction I wanted it to go in I knew it had to be a VR game I wanted to make something that was fast that was fun that didn't make people sick and um, I tried various things, I got very hung up on trying to make fairly complicated terrains and playing about with modules that did this and did that and none of them were particularly satisfying. Yeah, basically we spent, I would say, a good three months experimenting a lot of different ideas. Each one by itself was interesting, but we couldn't put them together and say, oh, this is actually a game that... And then I had to go back. Yeah, and then the, this, is, this is what happened. Um, basically, we tried this and that, and it got to the point where it was, like, it was like two weeks before we were supposed to go to Sony to give them a demo of, of what we'd made. And, get, and, and you know, producing the game based on that was going to be based on that demo being impressive. And we didn't have anything. So while he was gone, I just thought, well, I'm going to scrub everything back. I just took everything back to a basic tiled plane. And I thought, right, let's just slap some stuff in there, get some things in there to shoot, make a little spaceship. I had this little spaceship moving around. Finally got some stuff in there to shoot. And I thought, actually, this is starting to feel good. And it was all right, but it was still missing something. And then I had this idea of putting in these gates and then making it so when you had to fly through the gates, so you got a big speed boost when you went through them. And that's when it really started to click. Yeah, but I will say that at that point it was still one little step you forget. It was what really made the game. So the weather's gates, you were flying around, uh, you, there's the speed boost. And then uh, I can't remember why at some point it decided to say to put just a little blip just to give you a feedback that you are um, going through the gate. And then I can't remember, we put this blip, it came out. What if a blip gets a bit higher in pitch? As much as, as as you get speed, so you start like bleep, 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 and basically it's such a simple thing. But when you actually play it, it makes the game. I mean, <laughs> it's like uh, it makes you want to go faster and faster because you have this incentive. And I remember we went up to London to do this demo, and it was doubly nerve-wracking because when we got there, it turned out we'd built our demo on some really weird version of uh, of, of, of the operating system, and they actually had to. Uh, like contact Japan to get special permission ba to Basically download. what happened was that uh, in that time the PlayStation VR was still a secret prototype and we were part of what they were calling at the time strategic development so we were one of the very very few people that had access to that technology 
in so it turns out that they gave us a, a firmware and an SDK version for the PlayStation 4, it was still in development, that basically only people in our group was al allowed to have. So when we get there with all the, the software ready, it turns out, oh, we don't have a firmware release to actually run it. So they had to do a little bit of internal mess, ask a special permission to go to the secret lab that they didn't even know the existence of, to get this in you know, a USB key, the special version only for the time to try it. So it's been quite a bit funny because we get there already and it's like, oh, we can't run your program. Why not? <laughs> anyway, eventually we got it to run and we let the guy, uh, the guy who was going to make the decision, we let him play it and he sticks on the headset. And there's other guys watching the external view, and from the external view, you don't really get the full feeling of that game. You really need to be inside yeah. it. Yeah, I stopped it a second because it was funny. Nobody knew what we were expecting from us. They was thinking maybe a more traditional game, and this game was really like something like nothing else before. And it's like, are they going to like it, or maybe it's too much extreme? We are not going to like it. And while we were playing, uh, this guy was playing. Nobody was saying a word. It was us watching like that, as I we couldn't understand if he liked it or not. <laughs> anyway, eventually the guy finishes and uh, he takes off the headset and he looks around for a little bit and he said, "After after 30 seconds, I felt like a Jedi." <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, we thought, "Yeah, okay, we've got this." <laughs> <laughs> but I remember it was this guy called Spencer. He takes out the, the the thing, he put it down, and I was playing, and all in a sudden. I went Jedi and everything was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't you, you can't say better than that. <laughs> but yes, hopefully we'll do something. Uh, well, I like, like to do more, more. I would like to do more VR stuff moving forward. I definitely think it's a, it's the way to go. Okay, continuing about the style of your games and products, uh, you mentioned about the abstract style. Abstract style. Okay, that uh, combines well with your taste of music. I take it you like techno, rave, this, uh, this kind of hard music. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. We love techno. But I mean, the, the, the whole thing of, of abstract stuff linked to music goes back even further than that. I mean, uh, obviously, the other, the other side of LamaSoft has been, always been the development of lights, light synthesizers and visualizers. And that actually goes back to when I was 11 years old, and uh, Dark Side of the Moon came out. Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd came out, and my, my brother bought it, and it was the first album that I ever really liked. And I remember uh, I, I, I copied it by dangling a tape, you know, a, a mono microphone in, uh, in front of the record player and taping it onto a cassette. And I would take it into my room, and I'd turn the lights off, and I'd listen to this, and the music kind of inspired these abstract visions in my head. But, you know, I had visions of colors and things streaming past me. And I was thinking, one day I'd like to make a machine or I'd like to have a machine that will let me externalize these things that I, that I see in my head when I listen to Pink Floyd. Now, I was only 11 years old. This wasn't drug speaking, by the way. This was just my psychedelic imagination. And it was only many years later, after I'd been doing games for a year or so on the Commodore 64, that I thought I might try experimenting with some of those ideas using existing technology and that's when psychedelia came out followed by color space followed by um, uh, vlm the virtual light machine and then doing the audio reactive vlm on the jaguar and then the stuff we did on the xbox 360 it all it all grew out of basically listening to pink floyd when i was 11 years old that was where the t my taste for that came from and yes tech course techno fits right in because techno has got is full of energy and it just fits perfectly this stuff we we love techno actually last time we were at assembly this is in uh, uh 2004 they had a little uh, uh, uh techno room where in the evening you could go and they play some techno and we, could, we went along there and had a bit of a dance every night he broke his trousers in there he was dancing so enthusiastically he broke his trousers and he actually went on assembly tv with a big hole in his trousers and he had to keep his legs crossed the whole time so as not to show it. And he had to go home to Italy on the plane with a big hole in his well, trousers. Well, I have to say that in all assembly we couldn't find any way to fix those trousers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nobody had anything to fix them and I couldn't have another change. So question for the audience, is there a rave in assembly this year? Yes. Yes, when, when, where? Saturday night. Okay. Okay, but you better mind your trousers again then. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> because these guys are traveling really light. They don't have much spare clothes. 
No, 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 no. We just uh, just a few t-shirts, a couple of yeah. things, uh, toothbrush, and the, the basics. Yes, but I, I guarantee nobody else in the, in the, in the place has got a, any t-shirts like like this. There is a bit of a story attached to these t-shirts. We can get to that story because uh, let's talk about your life a little bit. Uh, both of you, you these guys, do you know where these wonderful people, specimens of humankind, live? They, yep, they live in Wales, deep, deep, in deep Wales. Yeah, we live in southwest Wales, in a yeah, pretty, pretty rural area. Uh, we have uh, a little place that's got seven acres of land. It's not, it's not big enough to be a farm, and we wouldn't want to be a farm because all, all of our animals are pets. Nobody goes to any slaughterhouses or anything like that. Everybody lives their whole life there. We, got a, we have seven pet sheep um, and um, one rather plump donkey and a llama. And uh, the sheep, uh, uh, every morning we do a broadcast on Periscope called Morning Sheep Time. So if you ever want to stop by and see our sheep receiving digested biscuits and lots of cuddles and ask us any questions or anything, then do drop by. We're pretty much every morning, Morning Sheep Time on Periscope. And you can find them, search Twitter with Jeff Minter and you will find the Twitter account. Hmm. Can't remember what its at name, but you mean the name of the Twitter? Yeah, is at Lamasoft underscore Orcs. Yeah, easy to remember. Or you just look for Jeff Minter, and I guarantee you, it's the best content in Twitter every day or almost every day. The morning sheep show where they go to the field and meet the sheep and llama and the donkey. I have to mention because it's incredibly good as well. Have you ever seen or heard of the story of someone made an AI program that simulate his tweeters on the, s on the train? No, no. That every time he goes on a train trip, he starts making some quite uh, funny tweets about, uh, in a quite humoristic way, about stuff that he sees while he's on the train during the trip. Some guy created a kind of artificial intelligence program that simulates his tweets and it's incredible. It's called <laughs> Jeff the Minter on a train. <laughs> it's incredible. It is, it is actually, it is actually quite funny. I mean, my train tweets are just something I, I do because I'm bored on trains and I kind of amuse myself by just observing people and what's going on and making comments about them, hopefully humoristic. And um, I've actually met some people who, f who follow me for my train tweets, my train tweets, and don't know anything about games. They just like the train tweets. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's actually be, it's it's quite amusing to see this, this artificial me. I, I will sometimes see this thing pop up and I'll laugh at it because it just comes up with the weirdest things, but that are, that are somehow very like what I would say. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, yesterday when I checked the Twitter, I was okay. I'm on a train. Okay, he's moving. I'm on a plane. Okay, scroll back. I'm a curry. I'm on curry house. Yep. <laughs> of course, we've got to be in the curry house. I've got to be in the curry house at least twice a week or I explode. <laughs> but going ba uh, back about uh, living in Wales in the almost farm, what kind of life do you live there, daily life? Um, well, basically we live a, a, a nice, quiet and relaxed life, really. I mean, we, we, because we work at home and, and we're both our own boss, really, since we are Lama well, Basically, we, to break it down very simple, you wake up in the morning, you get a cup of tea, otherwise it gets incredibly grumpy, then uh, maybe a second cup of tea, we go out, uh, we sort out the ship, we come back, I might get my cup of coffee, otherwise I go insane, and then basically we start working until... 9 p.m., 7 p.m., uh, what it is, then we go cup one hour or something to the pub, and then we come back home, and if we feel like it, we can keep working. But what, it, what, what is nice about it is that, I mean, it, it's a nice balance between immersing yourself in coding, which is very absorbing, and sometimes you can get a bit stressed out by work, and if you get stressed out, you can just literally take a few steps outside and be in the field and be cuddling a sheep, which I can assure you is an extremely relaxing thing to do. So there's a nice sort of work and, uh, uh, and chill balance which goes on most of the time. Um, 
twice a week we go out for curry most nights we go out down the pub just to get out of the house because uh, when you are living and working in the same place sometimes you just need to step away from you it know, otherwise, hour, so. otherwise there is a real risk you can be there 24 hours or 24 you're just fixed on your thing and then it's like oh, nobody sees you nobody knows you're alive so yeah it's it's it, it suits us because i mean our house you can if you didn't know it was there you wouldn't even see it because it's pretty much invisible from the road you'd miss the entrance it's behind a wall of trees and um, so we don't get many visitors and that's kind of the way we like it it's very very private very quiet and I think those are some of the best conditions for coding so it works well for us and incredible but true in the place that I was mentioning you it's difficult to get cell phone reception because of the house because of the trees because of the hill but we do have optical fibers going one meter away from our place <laughs> so we are on fiber optics in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, yeah, when we still only got fiber to the cabinet, but it's 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 not bad for a rural location. We've actually got pretty good internet. Okay, so you now have an idea about their life, but then tell us something, some background, backstory about these t-shirts. Oh, that's a big, that's yeah. a big story. Yeah, yeah, it it started out in a really strange way. Now, uh, for years, ever since I've been coding commercial I've had a thing of I, I like oxen I, my first coding name was yak I was known as yak for many years now I'm kind of known as llama soft ox or just ox and one day in 2006 he was away and I was at home on my own two o'clock in the morning probably had too many beers uh, just idly searching through stuff you know, weird stuff on the internet and I was thinking you know the ox is an animal which is it's not very glamorous. It's, it's, it's served humanity very well, but it's not very well celebrated. And I wondered if there was anywhere in the world where people were, you know, genuinely loved the ox. And so I did a search for, I think it was precious ox, to see if anybody found, you know, the, uh, uh, everybody, anybody anywhere thought an ox was precious. And I came across this academic paper about a place in the middle of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, that's actually 24 hours from uh, the capital of, of Amazonia by boat, where there are two teams that uh, celebrate this competition that's based around the story of the death and resurrection of a precious ox. And um, this festival takes place in a, a, a specially constructed arena called the Bombodromo, which is in the shape of an ox's head. And the two teams are actually called, they call themselves the uh, Capricious Ox, or Boy Caprichoso, and the, uh, the, the Reliable Ox, or Boy Garantido. And the ox is the most important character of this whole thing, and the whole town has a, a, a favourite ox. It's either the, the black ox with the blue star, which is Boy Caprichoso, or the white ox with the red heart, which is Boy Garantido. And there's, once a year, there is this huge festival where the teams of over 1,000 artists and musicians and dancers get together and compete for three nights at the end of June where they do continuous, each one does a continuous performance for two and a half hours um, which is uh, uh, this, these astonishing moving um, I can, uh, I can only describe it as being, being like animatronics but without any, any tronics this is all built and, and, and moved by, by human hands and Basically, if you imagine like something like the Carnival of Rio with all this construction, this is maybe even bigger, only uh, it is more local. And uh, this place, this Bombodromo, is capable to keep 35,000 people and it's full to the brim. And uh, the, it's, it's a uh, religious and cultural, um, because it has connection, as, um, it's a bit complicated because fundamentally in that place, there is a Complete, mi complete mixture between uh, Catholic uh, religion and all the various religions that are local. So you get uh, all the stuff from the real, from the Amazon tribes and the Catholic religion mixed together. And fundamentally, part of this representation, they have a bit to follow the story of this uh, of death and resurrection. But every year they have set up a team and they have, a, it's like a, almost a theater representation with all this allegoric stuff uh, and uh, they are judged uh, based on how good they done it, how good is the performance, how good... Anyway, I, I read about this stuff in 2006 and I thought, this sounds amazing. And I, I looked on YouTube to see if I could find anything about it. I found at that point there was only one clip of something that somebody in Brazil had filmed from their TV 
and it, at first it just showed the black ox dancing. Uh, I thought that looks amazing. Then the camera zoomed out and the, the black ox was dancing on what looked like a hand. I thought, okay. And then the, the camera zoomed out and it turned out the black ox was dancing on this hand that was part of this enormous statue and the statue was moving and then the camera pulled out a bit more and you saw this statue itself was dwarfed by the size of the stadium this thing was in and I was like holy cow that looks absolutely stunning and so in the intervening years I mean gradually the coverage of this got better eventually it got to the point where you could stream it and watch it from uh, uh, like a TV a Brazilian TV station would stream it on the internet you could watch it but I could never afford to go but earlier on this year, finally, we got to go. And so it was it's absolutely the best holiday of my life. I mean, for years, I've been wanting to get a T-shirt of my team, which was Boy Caprichosa. You cannot get these outside of Brazil. So I came back with a bag full of these, you better believe it. But it was absolutely, I'd, I'd seen it on TV, but it's nothing like seeing it in real life. It was absolutely stunning. And to actually finally be there in that arena that I'd first read about so long ago in the middle of the night in some stupid random internet search it led me halfway across the planet to this incredibly insane place where everybody loves the ox. It was, it was just absolutely brilliant and fantastic. And so, yeah, that's what this is all about. This is, this is Boy Caprichoso, who is the best ox. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh it's really impossible to explain. You have, you have to be there because when you are there and you find really 35,000 people in this place and everyone is performing, everyone is a role and then uh, there is an energy in this place that is really explosive. I mean, uh, you, you, that is unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, already just to get to that place because you're basically the only way to get there, you literally have to start from an house with a boat and you have to go 24 hours up the Amazon River and you start from an house but there's a civilization but the more you go out, in, out into the amazon the more you really start to get into the jungle away and away and away and when you get to this part in thing, it's like you are in the middle of the amazon forest like bloody hell this, this, this is something else <laughs> this is another planet <laughs> i mean in parenting even the phone booth is shaped like oxen <laughs> Yes, and the city, the whole city of Parintins is basically, is literally split. There is the blue part of the city and the red part of the city. And you have to be careful where you walk if you belong to one team or the other. <laughs> obviously, the, obviously, the uh, blue part is best. <laughs> no, but that's unbelievable. I mean, you know, what, what, what is lovely about it is that it is quite a fierce competition and there is deep loyalty that goes back to sort of generations in these people. <laughs> But there's never any trouble. It's like it's like football, but without the football and without the violence, and with a lot more dancing and the artistry. It's uh, really quite something. So I, I actually made a video game about it in in 2012. I did a game on the on iOS called Super Ox Wars, and it's actually ba it, it's just a um, it's a, a Star Force style vertically scrolling shooter, but it's based around the theme of these two oxen. And you, you get uh, uh, differing abilities and points depending on if you're the the black ox or, or the white ox. And uh, it's actually, we still got it available for free um, for uh, Android on our website if anyone wants to download it. So it's a nice nice shirt. They have it's a nice story behind them. And uh, let's have let's give you the possibility now to give, ask questions. Anybody? Microphone man. Questions. Questions? You don't want to know a little story about how why does it ex uh, ate your stuff in Italy that probably you don't know? Yeah. Very short. So basically, uh, computing in Italy, I'm Italian by the way, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a thing but it wasn't very well known. And I remember basically the first computer I ever actually seen available was the ZX80. And what is strange, the way that they say personal computing, the idea that you could have got a computer in the house and use it for something that came into Italy, was through the ham radio people. Because there was almost no one using that kind of stuff or working around that kind of stuff, except the ham radio community, for some reason, recognized the importance of using uh, the, compu the computers for something. So when the Zedati ca came uh, in Italy, the first people who ever start to actually buy and use that type of stuff was the ham radio community. And they done a lot of job with those kind of machines, like uh, uh, old, uh, 
audio repeaters, stuff, uh, they, they started to use it. And through the ham radio community, slowly this thing started to spread around. And I got to know exactly in, the in 1981, because it came a year after, I actually see my first computer was ZX80, because a friend of my dad, he was one of those completely lost for radios. And uh, he went to a ham uh, rally that is, was in a town close to mine, which is they still do it as one of the f famous r ham radio rallies they do in Italy and he went so beyond to say I want a thing I want a thing and he bought the ZS80 and this would be my first time and then after the Z80 came the Z881 and that was an ex again extremely big success in the ham radio community in Italy and that's how basically the thing slowly started to spread I mean through the ham radio community <laughs> Specky boy it was the only computer I was able to afford or computer in Italy at the time, you had to think about it. I still remember, I'll never forget, Z80 in Italy when it came out in 1981, it was costing, if I remember correctly, something like 300,000 Italian lire. Let's say about 270 pounds in current currency. But at the time, that was almost, I think, a third of the salary my dad was getting. So it was a lot of money. Um, and uh, after Brexit, we'll all be going back to uh, using the ZX81 because we won't be able to afford anything else. <laughs> no BBC micros or just ZX. No, 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 because no, uh, the BBC micro was only for rich kids, and we are not going to be rich kids after bloody Brexit, are we? <laughs> okay, let's try again. Questions? Terrace one? Um, hi. Um, hi. You have a rich and varied history in making all the games that you want to make without any regard for anyone else's opinions. So do you have any grand visions or big ideas of what you would still like to make but still have important to make? Uh, yeah, I think I, I would like to go more in the direction that we went with Space Giraffe. I know Space Giraffe was quite divisive. I know uh, a lot of people didn't didn't really get it and didn't really like it, and that and, and that's fair enough. I, I think in a way it's better to have made a game which evokes a strong emotional response, even if that's a negative emotional response, as long as there's a, a balancing positive emotional response in some people. And uh, with Space Giraffe, we had the best and worst reviews I've ever had. We had uh, 10 out of 10 reviews. We had guys saying it was the best thing ever made on the Xbox 360. And we had people saying it was utter garbage and how dare we come out with that. Um, but I personally enjoyed the direction it was going in. I kind of liked the idea of merging together the light synth stuff and the, and the game stuff and just making it so abstract that you almost kind of have to push your brain out to new limits to understand what's going on. And um, I think I could have made it more accessible. I think I shouldn't have made it look as much like Tempest as it did because people expected it to play like Tempest and it really didn't play like Tempest. But I would like to go further in that direction one day and, and, and see how far I can push the limits and maybe start doing that kind of stuff in virtual reality. I want to take advantage to add a little thing because it has to be said, it has to be said. Our first game we were supposed to do in VR was Tempest in VR. TXK the VR version and we made it and it's awesome it's absolutely psychedelic and nice and whatever so if any of you maybe can convince Atari to say that they want the PSVR version we can still do it but they didn't want it oh yeah yeah it, Tempest in VR is absolutely wonderful and uh, so it was it was done and dusted but Atari made us take it out so. you know, it's awesome trust me it's awesome we have it we can play it nobody else can but it's absolutely amazing Anyone else? Questions? Hey, you university guys, don't you have anything to ask? Okay. Um, I remember the, um, those Atari magazines in the uh, ST Times. They were of the opinion that the Lamasoft games were better on the Atari and uh, than, uh, than on the Amiga, and that is of course an age-old fight between the two. How was it working uh, with these two machines? Um, well, I, I was primarily an ST person, and uh, the reason for that is basically that in the early days of the Amiga, Commodore really were actively discouraging games people from using the Amiga in the UK. They wanted to promote the Amiga as a business machine, 
And so, uh, like for, uh, for example, the the on uh, the launch party, the the Amigo, I wasn't even invited. I had to like uh, tag along with the journalist to go in and see it. Um, and so, Amigo, I mean, uh, Commodore were, were kind of hostile to games people, whereas uh, Atari were bending over backwards to get us early machines to get us started. So that's why I became an S, more of an ST programmer. And I'm afraid that most of the stuff I did on the Amiga probably didn't run quite as well as it did on the ST purely because it was often just ported from the ST without, without regard for, for the Amiga's special uh, custom chips at all. The only one which I think worked out better on the Amiga was probably uh, Revenge of the Mutant Camels, where I did in fact use the hardware sprites for the camel. But I, well, I can't say that I ever really effectively used the special capabilities of the Amiga to, their, to any decent extent at all. So perhaps that's why they ran slightly better on the ST, because I simply wasn't using the Amiga properly. Thanks. OK, anyone else? Come on, now it's your chance. OK, I can ask one question. Okay. How does it feel like to be in Finland once again? <laughs> it's nice, especially now it's summer. <laughs> First time I came here was, I think, in 2002. I went to the alt party. And it was winter, and boy, that was cold. I was really, really not, not ready for that. Um, but yeah, no, it's nice now. It's good to be back. It's just, it's been a long time. So the last time we were here was 2004. So what, 15 years now? So uh, yeah, it's 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 good to be back. It's uh, uh, so we've we've only been here a few hours yet, so we haven't really had much chance to have a look around and uh, and settle in. But uh, yeah, it's it's nice. And, the, and your your trains are lovely and much better than ours. <laughs> They are on time. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are usually not, or quite often. Do they cost more than an airplane? <laughs> I'm not sure. Not uh, sure. I think no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should be wrapping this up in a moment. And let's go with two more questions. And one of them being, Jeff, you have coded games for so many different machines to more machines than most people have ever heard about. What's the most obscure machine you have coded a game? Um, that would probably be the new one. Uh, but the new one was also probably the most interesting machine I ever coded on. Uh, it was the last, what I would call the last great assembly language machine. The, well, the, the, the architecture was fascinating. The architecture had both coarse grain and fine grain parallelism in that it was a, uh, a variable length VLIW core. So you built up instruction packets. You, uh, you could have up to seven different things that you could put in each instruction packet that you could put on different parts of the CPU. So you could have like you know, an adder doing something, a multiplier doing something else, a DMA being set up here, all these things you could lace together. And um, you also had four of these processors running in parallel. Um, which served as the, core, the main core of the machine. Each of them only had 4K of memory. Well, I tell you, there's one that had 16K of memory, but we, did, we didn't get to use that. Um, so you had to DMA in your, your uh, you had to do, basically use DMA to continuously bring in code overlays onto all of these machines and synchronize everything and break the screen up into squares and, 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 and parcel everything out. Uh, and it was, that was part of its downfall, really, because as an assembler programmer, I found it incredibly fascinating to work on this stuff. And I loved it, and I'd think nothing about spending two weeks reducing an inner loop from like 10 ticks to 8 ticks to get, the, uh, to get the best performance I could, making sure every single instruction packet was absolutely rammed full. But by that stage, everybody was onto the, the PlayStation where you just did everything in C, and it was really easy. So. There were, there were probably only about sort of 20 of us who could ever code the thing to any decent extent. And so it wasn't really any, any uh, wonder that there were only 11 games made for it and only, only one of them was really much good. It, it still impresses me the story that you were telling me, that guy that you had uh, that made the emulation of a, of a chipping scheme. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the original emulation of the chip for we had hardware was actually written in, in a dialect of Lisp <laughs> called Scheme. Um, uh, it was. I mean, it would take. I mean, to render two lines of pixels would take you most of the day, but it, it, it did enable you to like try out different instruction sets. One of the things that we were doing before they committed to silicon was trying out different variations of the instruction set. So it made it quite entertaining. You go into the office in the morning, and all your code you'd written the last week would be broken because they changed the instruction set. So now, now do a new version with a new instruction set. 
but it was very interesting because I'd never been around the actual design of a chip before and even though it didn't it never achieved commercial success I still learnt quite a lot from working on it and I, I, I enjoyed my work it was it was good tell them one second the little story of the fat lines because that's interesting as well Oh, at the fat lines, there was a guy, well, the, 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 the task was originally handed to an ex-Sega uh, coder who was there, who tried to work on uh, a routine to basically render these fat glowing lines of an arbitrary thickness. And um, he tried for a few weeks and he couldn't do it. He said, oh, fucking hell, Jeff, you go off and you do it. And I, I had to sit and, and, and scratch my head and work out how to break this thing up into little tiny chunks and it involved these little lists of line segments being DMA'd in and having to traverse these lists and work out how far you were from the line and calculate the intensity. And I got it working in the end and you had various different line styles you could use but boy it was hard work. So earlier we were talking with Garrett over there that these guys they should do a demo for old school demo competition. If they made a demo for Nuon to the old school competition, would you vote for it? Yes. Shout it, shout it! Yeah. Maybe, one maybe, and others, yes. Okay, so you have to make it. Okay, uh, until <laughs> I... <laughs> This means how to get crazy to make some stuff to work, because we still have something of Nuon that could work. Nobody has ever made a demo for Nuon, so that would be... The, the there is actually, somebody's working on a Nuon emulator, amazingly oh. enough. I don't, I don't think it runs anywhere near full speed yet, but there has been homebrew made on the Nuon, so it is a possibility. Okay, and for the last one, last bit, uh, let's say two favorite games you have made, and why they are your favorite games, each of you. Um, I would say, well, obviously Space Giraffe, for the reasons that I've mentioned before, and um, I'm, I'm not just going to I'm not just just going to say Polybius because that's that would be trying to I'm, I'm going to go back a bit and I'm going to say Llamatron because I've always loved Robotron and Llamatron was my sort of uh, slightly uh, different take on Robotron and also I know that Eugene Jarvis himself actually played it and liked it and I'm really proud of that fact. <laughs> Me games have we made. Well, yeah, Space Giraffe is definitely, it's been also my very first, uh, as I say, my serious thing that I've done uh, together with him, because uh, basically the core of it has been made in two weeks, because we have two weeks of time to make a proof of concept to Microsoft, because we had, they were really, really tight times, um, and um, they wanted the technology uh, embedded into the Xbox, so they wanted to say, okay, let us show something, uh, that's all. And another game that I like quite a lot, in all in all, but especially for the story how we came out, I have to say it's um, Five a Day. Oh, Five a Day. <laughs> Explain that just quickly the, the story of Five a Day. Uh, five a Day, basically, I, w I wanted to do a game, this was what I did on iOS, I wanted to do a game that was roughly based on uh, Time Pilot, Time Pilot being a favourite of mine overhead sort of scrolling multi-directional scroller thing with a little, your ship in the middle and you flew around and shot these things and anyway, I was looking for sound effects for this thing and I went on to, to free sound I looked through there see what they've got and, uh, and the available sound effects I looked started looking up space and I was, was looking for classic spaceship yeah, exposure so I, I started looking up space you know, space spacey and I suddenly came across all these like chimes and temple bells and things like that and they sounded so good I started to put them all into this game and it kind of reinformed it all from being this hard edge space game to being this weird game where you kind of drift through the clouds and collect fruit and while rainbows come out of your ship and, and it makes these so basically it noises. went from uh, space shooter to new age space shooter <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 in between level, all the, uh, in between levels, all the fruit comes out of your ship and cascades over the screen. And if you're lucky, you get uh, a Pinkie Pie out of My Little Pony goes shooting across the top. Okay, and we have to stop now, so we want, we can get the Quake competitions to go on again. Continue. Chef has never played Quake. Uh, I can try, uh, <laughs> but uh, I never you, played you it. Have. Yeah, you have. No, no, okay. I, 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 ha I, I played it years ago. I haven't played for years. He's never played Quake. No, okay. Never. Uh, they will be back tomorrow here. I'll be talking about the pop culture icon Jeff Minter in Bandersnatch. Uh, oh <laughs> yes, that, that thing. <laughs> and they will be around here, I guess, for today, tomorrow. So you can 
catch them anytime you want. Yes, and, do yeah. feel free to interact with us. Okay, so <laughs> thank you, thank you guys, thank you guys. I, know, I, I, I apologize for my watch. Thank you.